Hey guys, Bartel's Bookshelf here, and today I'm talking about uh, the last three books in Jack L. Chalker's Dancing God series. I read and reviewed the first two books in 2022 on my channel, and uh, as uh, we moved into the new year, um, you know how it is in the new year, in the new year or during the holidays, you know, in that transitional period where um, you you, you want to read something, but you're not really in the mood for anything super complex. So I read the third book. And I got through it so quickly, and I and I had enough fun with it that I was like, you know what? I've had these books sitting here since 2022 when I bought them. I might as well they're they're quick reads. I might as well finish off the series. And I had enough thoughts about them that I figured I'd just stick it all in this one video and just kind of ramble about it for a little bit. So, as always, I apologize if this is a little bit uh, rambly and unfocused. This is all off the cuff. So, um, yeah. But let's get into it. I hope you enjoy it. There might be spoilers. I don't know. It just kind of depends on you know. There's some of the things that I that I've been thinking about and that I want to talk about are kind of conducive to spoilers, but I mean, this is a really old, silly fantasy series from the 80s and 90s, so it's not like, you know, some big epic like uh, Star Wars or whatever, you know. Um, it's not really based around plot as such. So for those of you who don't uh, remember, uh, Jack Chalker's uh, Dancing God series was, uh, the first book was River of Dancing Gods, published in 1984, which is about... Um, two people from Earth, uh, Marge and Joe, who uh, get uh, swept away to this uh, fantasy world uh, called um, Husakwar that's basically um, the, the basis for all fantasy literature uh, and fiction in, um, in, in our world, you know. Um, they cross there through uh, what's called the Sea of Dreams, and, and uh, it's mentioned several times that, you know, the only way that most humans can come in contact with Husakwar is through dreams and fantasies and things, and that leads into the creation of fantasy fiction and things like that. And while there, uh, Joe and Marge get transformed into a barbarian and a, a fairy, resp uh, respectively, and um, they uh, go on adventures to stop the, the Dark Baron to save the world, obviously. And the thing that makes uh, Husakwar sort of unique uh, as compared to other generic fantasy worlds is that it's built as a generic fantasy world in that there's entire, there's reams of, of these books called The Rules that are all very strictly governed rules about how the fantasy world should operate. So, for example, in the first book, there's a rule about how um, all women within reason, you know, all, all like, you know, fantasy heroic women within reason must be scantily clad, that kind of thing, you know, playing into fantasy tropes and stuff like that. Um, Jack Chalker uh, was an interesting writer. Um, I, I don't have a lot of experience, I don't have any experience with his sci-fi stuff yet, which is what he's more known for. He wrote um, the well, well of Souls series, which is kind of his most famous uh, creation. I have all of, the, all of the books, haven't read them yet, but from what I understand and from what I've read of these books, Chalker had some uh, interesting proclivities. <laughs> um, I'll just say the, the the main thing that struck me about these books is that they're very, very horny. <laughs> um, there's lots of uh, scantily clad women. Uh, he seemed very interested in physical transformations. Um, as you read this whole series in order, uh, it really strikes you how uh, frequently... People transform into different forms, different bodies. Uh, you know, they swap gender and sex and race at the, at the drop of a hat. He was very, very uh, interested in that kind of stuff, it seems. So the uh, the third book, uh, Vengeance of the Dancing Gods, deals with Joe and Marge taking down the Dark Baron after he's been exiled to Earth, um, and he ends up using Earth technology and, uh, and a sort of a disciple of his to... Um, create these, like, ultra-powerful spells that he can use to sort of uh, get uh, get a foothold in Earth and then eventually use that to get back to Husakwar, or take over the world, you know, your typical fantasy stuff. This one was published in 1985, which was a year after the first two, and it's still very much in line with the first two. Uh, I think the first three books kind of form a loose trilogy, which is uh, intentional, I believe, because at the end of the first book they make a joke about how, you know, every, uh, every fantasy epic must at least be a trilogy, you know, Lord of the Rings, that kind of thing. This already, though, takes some interesting... Uh, uh, turns that uh, the previous two books didn't go into, in which um, Joe, you know, who's this very big, buff, muscular barbarian type, you know, Conan the Barbarian-esque, um, he ends up uh, at one point in the story getting transferred into the body of a wood nymph, and uh, in this uh, world, wood nymphs are basically um, airheaded bimbos whose whole uh, po whose whole thing is to have sex with people, and you know, and that's how they propagate. That's kind of the uh, the first sort of inkling that, that things are a little bit different. There's a lot of uh, heaving and angst on the part of uh, Joe about being in a fe an effeminate body and how that kind of uh, butts up against his sort of, a, you know, masculine upbringing. Things are already kind of uh, horny uh, with, um, you know, the previous books because uh, the way that Marge works, she's a type of fairy called a cowrie, cowrie, 
uh, whose uh, entire thing is that they're they're basically like a good succub succubi, where um, rather than where succubi you know suck out men's souls through sex, Kauri um, basically suck out people's um, uh, bad feelings, their insecurities, their depression, and sort of leave them feeling better and more confident about themselves. They're almost like sex therapists in a way. And uh, Chalker seems to get a lot of relish out of describing. Uh, <laughs> Marge's uh, escapades. None of it is sexually explicit, but just the way that he lingers over, you know, the sexual aspects of her of her race is um very pronounced. And again, that's uh, very much uh, enhanced in this book, where uh, Joe becomes a wood nymph, and uh, over the course of the story, his sort of wood nymph nature starts to take over because the way that the rules work sort of is like whatever body you're, you're you're transferred into, you start to sort of become that thing. You sort of exemplify that stereotype, kind of. It doesn't. It's not like that for everybody. Uh, it's not usually like that for them because they're they're Earth people, which is part of the reason they were brought over. It's complicated. There's a lot of lore and shit. But what was interesting to me was that um, once he's uh, transferred into the wood nymph's body, as I said, his wood nymph nature starts to take over, and he starts feeling you know s sexier and hornier, and he starts you know looking at men in different ways than he would before. And of course, this is horrifying to his you know male hetero brain. Um, but over the course of the book, he does eventually, uh, when his sort of nymph side takes over, he ends up having sex with a few, you know, dudes and kind of feeding from them. And that was really interesting to read about in a fantasy book from the 80s where he kind of, uh, where Chalker just kind of very cavalierly pushes uh, the envelope of, you know, the, the boundaries of, you know, sex and gender and stuff like that. Of course, uh, you know, <laughs> becoming female is treated, you know, from Joe's perspective as this horrible thing. And um, him uh, having these, like, lustful feelings towards men is, like, uh, you know, unfair. Thinkable. And at the end of the story, uh, of course, uh, he does get restored into not his uh, barbarian body, but his original Joe body before he came to, to Husaquar. But still, it's it's this very interesting sort of a pushing of the envelope in regards to sort of gender roles. And aside from that, you know, there's a couple entertaining things in this book. Um, they meet up with uh, this uh, master thief named Makor, who was in the previous two books. And along the way, they uh, go back to Earth, because that's where uh, the Dark Baron is located now. And um, while on Earth, uh, McCor gets obsessed with the show Gilligan's Island. He ends up watching it on TV in their hotel room. And, he, and it just, like, completely takes him over. And uh, he just becomes determined about, you know, it's like, it's like a religion for him. It's like his new thing. He's obsessed with it. Um, and that was pretty funny. There's a lot of talk about how, you know, like, oh, no wonder, you know, the, the dumb thief is into, you know, I always knew that show was for dummies, you know. Like, it, it's, it's pretty entertaining. It's very silly. Again, very much in, in the vein of, like, a Piers Anthony type thing. Very, very, this has very similar vibe to the Xanth novels, including all of the um, author appeal, as TV tropes would call it. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of an in that was an interesting one. And it ends, I think, in a very uh, satisfying way. It feels like a fairly well-sealed-off trilogy, even if uh, Joe ends up in, uh, in a different body than his own. It's still a male body, you know, um, they've defeated the bad guy, you know, that kind of thing. And th I thought this ended in a pretty satisfying way, where... Um, Joe ends up meeting up with his young son, Irving, and um, bringing him to um, Husaquar, um, giving him, you know, a sort of option. And I, I liked that. There was actually, and there was another, a similar scene with Marge where she visits her ex-husband uh, in a disguised as sort of herself. And she has sex with him and sort of takes out all, all the lingering insecurities that he had from their old relationship. And that's kind of her... Um, her way of uh, sort of, uh, that, that's her last goodbye to, to Earth. So there were some things like that that I thought were very emotionally satisfying. And I really, and I liked the ending. I liked where we left us off. And so as I said, I, I had so much fun with it that I immediately went into the next book, which was Songs of the Dancing Gods. This one was really interesting. This is where things start to get a little bit stranger. And another interesting thing about it is that this was, pu this was published in 1990, uh, five years after the previous book. So I don't, I don't, I don't know why he felt the need to return to it. Maybe you know he just felt he had more to say. I'm, I'm not sure. And this is where things start to get really interesting, and the uh, the body and sort of gender swapping gets really crazy. So in this book, as Milio Boquilas or Boquias, how you however you pronounce it, the Dark Baron gets transferred into the body of Mahalo McMahon, who was this uh, very sexy sort of Hawaiian woman that they met in the previous book. And uh, she ends up sort of embracing her role as a woman. Um, she seems to really, really enjoy it, to the point where, um, through a complicated series of... Uh, misadventures. She has uh, Joe's uh, barbarian wife. Uh, she has her body transferred into Joe's old barbarian body and uh, basically wants them to live together as a couple and sort of trick the world of Husaquar that they're, you know, these demigods. It's a complicated story. Joe and his and his barbarian wife were basically uh, 
installed into this uh, society as demigods in the, in, at the end of the second book. And in the third book, they sort of leave that to go on their adventure. And then they're reinstated or meant to be reinstated in this book so that um, the Baron can sort of like, you know, put his little fingers into everything, um, use the power of religion to, you know, sort of get his uh, needs done. But it was very interesting to see uh, a character who, um, unlike Joe in the previous book, was uh, happy to be who she was and to sort of embrace it. Um, almost uh, sort of trans-coded in a way. Um, I don't know if that was intentional on the part of Chalker, but it was it was interesting. And again, uh, it just gets even crazier with all the body switching and stuff. Joe, it turns out, for, through again, through a complicated series of uh, events, that Joe has uh, ended up in... Um, <clears throat> Joe, even though he's in his sort of uh, regular male form, he still has sort of the, a little bit of the wood nymph spirit inside of him. And uh, toward the end of the book, which is uh, what's depicted here on the cover, uh, he actually sacrifices himself to basically uh, keep uh, his body from being used for the Baron's, you know, sort of evil ends. But because of that, his fairy soul is still alive, and so he is sort of reincarnated as a wood nymph who's connected to this tree, which is the Tree of Knowledge. Again, long story, I'm not going to go into all of it. So he ends up again in a female body, and this time in a female body that's not easily uh, wished away. So, a a as I said, Chalker seemed to have some really interesting feelings about sort of sex and gender. It's almost like you can sort of feel like two different sort of uh, mentalities sort of warring with each other, because on the one hand... He's sort of freely embracing this uh, gender-bending sort of aspect. And then on the other hand, you know, you have um, all, all of the people who really, truly, like, sort of embrace their their, their gender-bending ways are the bad guys, like the Baron. But then at the same time, you have people like Marge who sort of uh, come to, uh, to Joe and sort of uh, try and talk him out of his sort of male thinking. So it, it's interesting. It's like, it's like, you know, these warring mentalities and, um, you know, I have no idea what Chalker was going through, but, you know, it just seemed like he had a lot of... Uh, hang-ups about gender and sex and things like that and of course you know there's lots of uh in regards to sex there's lots more stuff about the cowrie and everything and their sexual wiles and using sex as a weapon and that kind of thing aside from you know all of the sexual stuff one of the things that i really enjoyed about this book was the continuation of mccore's storyline where he's become so obsessed with uh gilligan's island that he's sort of gone on this pilgrimage to try and find uh ways to um Re re recharge the batteries for his uh, TV and VCR player, you know, so he can watch all of the Gilligan's Island episodes. And uh, as I said, it's like a religion for him. He's obsessed. He's basically like gone insane with his obsession over it. And towards the end of the book, when they're in the barren sort of a little evil volcano hideout here, they find a, a series of zombies um, that are being controlled by sort of a, the, the Baron's other sort of second in command this uh, necromancer named Sugasto, um, and all of his zombies that he's resurrected are standing around the TV watching Gilligan's Island, just, just completely, like, absorbed by it, and, um, yeah, that was pretty funny. But yeah, again, you know, you can sort of see him kind of pushing at the boundaries of sex and gender in this one, kind of almost afraid to really take it all the, take it all the way and put actual, you know, sort of, like, queer characters or themes in, in, in these books. It's just very interesting. You know, there's lots of, like, uh, intimations of, sort of, homosexuality and, and you know, and gender bending. There's jokes made at people's expenses, but he doesn't really, like, push things all the way there. It's almost like he was kind of afraid to, like, make that last leap. And then we get to the final book in the series, Horrors of the Dancing Gods. And again, this one was published five years after the previous book. This is 1995, and this is the final book in the series. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not sure what he was trying to work through in this series, or, or why he felt the need to return to it. There's even an introduction in this book where he talks about, The Dancing Gods books, however, are very much a series, and so open-ended that even I have no idea when I start one if it's going to be my last. And he mentions, you know, leaving some things uh, unchecked because, of course, at the end of the, the last book, Joe is still in the body of a wood nymph and all that stuff. So I was intrigued going into this one, and I was uh, doubly intrigued when it mentioned that um, the whole sort of uh, premise of this one, as you can kind of guess by the title, was it's about um, Marge uh, Pokwa, uh, the sort of emir... Um, fairy guy who's like kind of the there he's ruddy gore's bodyguard and he's kind of throughout the series he's he's described as being like mr spock and uh joe's son irving who's older now and by this time has become you know this big black barbarian kind of reminds me of a uh, george george r saunders uh Imaro, if anyone remembers that and they have to go to uh yugoth isle which is basically like the horror version of Husaquar. it's this island where all horror fiction sort of stems from uh, and they have to go there to uh, find out what happened to joe uh wood nymph joe because he went off on a quest to find the great MacGuffin, which is this thing that is supposedly able to uh, return him to his uh, normal form 
So essentially, the premise of this one was that rather than poking fun at fantasy tropes, he was poking fun at horror tropes. And I was really excited about that. Although, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't really go anywhere beyond a few references, which was really disappointing. You know, he mentions Cthulhu, Yogg-Sothoth, um, Lovecraft, you know, Stephen King. Actually, the, the, the Stephen King part was the best. So part of the uh, this adventure is that they have to go and meet the king of horror who lives in a place called Castle Rock. And uh, when they meet him... Uh, they find out that he has a hotel nearby called The Overlook. And then when they actually meet the king, he's very obviously Stephen King. He doesn't say that he's Stephen King, but you know who it is. That was pretty entertaining. But other than that, he doesn't really engage with a lot of horror concepts or tropes, which is disappointing because he mentions in the introduction that this was meant to be kind of his takedown of, of, of horror fiction and of the horror genre. And it doesn't really live up to that, in my opinion. Also, this just moves at a very, very slower clip compared to the other books. The, the other books in the series are fast-paced, they're episodic, there's lots of stuff going on, lots of little mini-adventures. But in this one, most of this book is just traveling to the island, getting on a boat, going there, you know, getting on a, on, on a tram, you know, like, like it's all, it's all just, it's all traveling to this island. And then the last maybe, like, eight, 60 to 80 pages is them actually on the, the you know, Yugoth Isle. And it's just, uh, it's just very weak, and, and the humor isn't as biting. Uh, there's a lot more stuff just kind of based on references and just uh, and being and, you know, and using lots of puns, which, again, puts me in mind of, like, the Xanth series, you know, Piers Anthony, that kind of thing. But it just feels a lot more stale and a lot more slow and a little bit and a lot less kind of imaginative. As I said, one of the things that sort of kept me intrigued and kept me reading was how um, he takes all of the sort of gender and sexuality stuff in this book and, and like, cranks it up to 11. So Irving, uh, for uh, to start off, has had a spell put on him that will bet basically makes him sort of irresistible to women, but at the same time, he's had another spell put on him by uh, Ruddy Gore to... Uh, sort of uh, make him asexual, you know, because they can't have a 16-year-old kid running around banging everybody. So Joe uh, abandoned uh, Irving at the beginning of this book. He, uh, they, they told him that he was dead because Joe, like, just couldn't stand his son seeing him as a woman, you know, that masculine mentality. Uh, and so he, he, he went off, you know, and then he went off on this adventure to, uh, to you know, re restore himself with the Great MacGuffin. And Irving comes along on the mission to rescue Joe, even though, you know, he has a lot of resentment towards him as, a, as an absent father. So he's been forced to be raised in the castle by Ruddy Gore and everyone, and they don't really know how to raise kids. So instead of, like, letting him kind of do his own thing, they put that said, you know, sexuality spell on him, all that stuff. Uh, but then, on the trip over, they meet uh, this young black woman who uh, named um, Larray who uh, he is just enamored by. And, of course, they believe that it has something to do with the rules, so they decide to take her along with them. And she also has a curse on her as a way of avoiding a uh, debt that she had where she was to be, to be uh, sacrificed to a demon as the firstborn daughter. And uh, they take a while to figure out what that is. And it turns out that uh, in order to sort of get around, you know, being the firstborn daughter thing, they gave her a penis. Uh, not, you know, turning her fully into, you know, biologically male, that kind of thing. She's basically a dick girl. <laughs> and the way that that is discovered, she drugs Irving and sleeps with him. Um, and uh, and so then uh, the rest of the book is sort of Irving kind of agonizing over his feelings for her because he really likes her. Um, they have a lot of chemistry. They feel connected to each other because of their race, which is something else I'll get into in a bit. So that and so then it gets into this weird and kind of interesting mentality where like there's a lot of stuff in this book where they argue over, like, you know, sex and gender and, like, whether uh, Larray is, like, male or female. Uh, in fact, Larray has a conversation at one point. Uh, let me find it. And I'll just read this little bit for, to you here. You speak as if it were a trifle, like a mole or a deep voice. All I am saying is that the true curse isn't that, isn't that being there so much as what you say, that I am almost wholly of one sex with the organ of the other. It is strange somehow, but do you know that I have actually been in some ways more comfortable this way? What? She nodded. I do not fear rape, since the rapist will only get an ugly joke on him, yes? I have had no period in almost a year now, with all that implies, and I cannot be made with child. There is a confidence in being male that you would not understand. You were born that way. There's certain freedom, a sense of independence and power that as a woman I was without. Would you rather have been born a guy? 
Perhaps. I am still undecided on that. Certainly in my culture and in the others I've seen so far, the human ones anyway, it is preferable if one ever wishes to break out and become someone important, do adventurous, romantic things, and take chances on life. And of course, had I been born a boy, I would not exactly be sitting here now, would I? The curse was on, was on the first-born girl. Is that what you'd wish for, then? He asked her, feeling a bit distanced from someone he was growing to like an awful lot, no matter what her problems. To have been born a boy or to become one fully? She shrugged. I do not know. That is the truth. Your prize is within the rules. It may have powers to destroy worlds, but it might well not have the power to dissolve a demonic contract. We shall see. We will have to get there first. So there's little discussions like that where, again, you can kind of feel Chalker kind of pressing at the boundaries of sex and gender, but almost like afraid in a way to like really engage with them. Because of course, you know, being that this was written when it was by, as far as I know, a cishet uh, white man in his 50s, um, some of the language around sex and gender is not, uh, you know, the way that we, you know, it's not, is not the most progressive. And yet at the same time, he has these little moments of, like, clarity and uh, almost embracing of alternative uh, sex and gender roles. But at the same time, there's this, like, prurient aspect to it where it's almost like he's getting off on it. It's just so strange. And that really reaches ahead toward the end of the book, where they find uh, Joe and his uh, other companion from the beginning of the book, where um, Joe is still a wood nymph, but they've both been turned into trees. And it turns out that Boquillus, the Dark Baron, has come back as this, like, you know, very fertile demon man, and has um, basically raped and impregnated these uh, tree people. And uh, as part of his sort of, uh, you know, perverse uh, plans... He, uh, he, he shoots a spell at Larray, and he basically turns her into a exaggerated dick girl. He gives her, you know, exaggeratedly feminine features, and then, you know, makes her cock huge. <laughs> Did I mention this isn't for kids? And then uh, he, he thinks about, you know, like, oh, what am I going to do to Irving? Oh, perhaps I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you a vagina, and then you can be with her, you know, sexually. Um, but before he can do that, you know, the deus ex machina shows up. And I won't get into all that, because, again, it's complicated, and that's not really the point of this sort of uh, ramble. But then at the end of the story, once, uh, you know, the bad guys vanquished, they realize, you know, oh, the magic's too powerful. We can't reverse it. We can't <laughs> reverse you from being a dick girl, but we can make you into your old self, you know, with, with the dick. And Irving, uh, who throughout the book has been sort of agonizing about this this whole time, you know, worrying about like, oh, I love her. She's so pretty. I love her. But she has a penis. Um... And then he approaches Ruddy Gore and he says, Hey, if the only way I can be with her is for you to give me a vagina, then I'm willing to do that. And Ruddy Gore says, No, you're 16. You know, I'll give it a couple more years. And if you still feel that way, then I'll do it. So, uh, again, with, 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 with the Baron and his weird sexual stuff, with, you know, the dick girls and the, and the, and the, and the genital swapping and all this stuff, there's so much bizarre and, like, fascinating <laughs> stuff in this book. And... Again, it's that weird mix of, like, you can feel him kind of wanting to engage with it more seriously, but then kind of backing off or, like, being too scared to really follow through with it. You know, sort of having these, like, very progressive uh, thoughts for the time, but then kind of uh, negating it with this very sort of, like, you know, uneducated language on gender. You know, like, throughout the book, they keep referring to um, Larray as, like, almost a woman or not entirely a woman or not a real woman, which, of course, you know, isn't how we would talk about that these days. But, again... He was an older man, white cishet, as far as I know, uh, in, in his 50s. But you can clearly, at least I felt that, it seemed like he was really working through some stuff. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, uh, I don't like to diagnose people. And I'm not here to, like, read autobiography into his fiction. But it just, it just, it, it gives you pause. Um, it just makes me wonder, I mean, what would it have been like if he was writing this today? If he was a little bit younger and more aware of, you know, LGBTQ plus issues and stuff. How would this have turned out? But at the same time, as I said, it's just interesting to see something like this, some all this like crazy gender and sexuality stuff being tackled in this kind of, you know, paperback uh, fantasy novel from the 90s. And then in the, and then again, on the same token, you have all of the pervy sort of Piers Anthony-esque shit, you know, with lots of sexual assault and rape and stuff like that. And I don't know, man. It's just there was just something, despite the fact that I, I was kind of getting tired of this by the end, 
there was just something really compelling about it from a from a in a weird sort of way. Unfortunately, uh, Jack Chalker passed away in 2005 without ever completing uh, a sequel to this, and that's one of the things that also really irritated me about this is that it kind of ends. In a, on a very um, open note. In fact, it even makes mention that, you know, one of the rules in the book is that, you know, it, one of the rules in this universe is that no saga is ever over as long as there is, you know, a lingering thread that hasn't been resolved. Again, we are left with a lot of lingering threads at the end of this book, um, but this was the last one. He never, he never wrote any more. I'm not sure why, because this was published in 1995, and he, he died in 2005, and he was writing pretty much up until he was hospitalized in around 2004. In fact, he was working on something before uh, he was hospitalized. So it just makes me wonder, I mean, why, why didn't he return to this? Was it, Maybe it wasn't profitable. Maybe he just didn't know where to go with it. Maybe he was afraid of pursuing it to its uh, logical uh, endings, you know, in regards to all of his feelings about sex and gender and all that stuff. I don't know. But there, there's so many moments like that, not just in regards to sexuality and gender, but again, in reference to race. One of the other things that surprised me about this series is that it's quite uh, racially diverse. Um, Joe is um, Native American, and uh, his wife, his ex-wife, is black. So um, Irving, his son, is you know half Native, half black. And there's a lot of dialogue in the books uh, about race and about... Um, how, you know, people perceive uh, Joe differently because he was native. You know, they would call him Geronimo and stuff like that. Um, Irving talks about, you know, growing up in Philadelphia, you know, in, in the slums, you know, with gangs and things. And again, people perceiving him differently because he was a black man, you know, or a black kid. But again, like, it, it, it's just so weird to be, like, reading about this stuff in, like, essentially what's a very silly, stereotypical, over-the-top fantasy novel with all this, like, pervy stuff in it. It's just, there was just something about that mix of strangely, like, uh, clear-eyed progressive themes with like you know very regressive uh, sexual and, and gender politics and stuff that I don't know man there was just something really weird and bizarre and fascinating about it so I ended up reading through these whole books all, all three books in like two weeks so yeah I don't I don't know if necessarily I would recommend these if, if you're in the mood for something kind of silly and stereotypical and kind of weird um, I would definitely go for it but yeah they were they were just very interesting and I definitely need to, I want to read more Chalker after this, especially because we share a lot of the same interests. I have an interest in, you know, transformation and things like that. I, I love werewolves. It's a, uh, you know, f uh, body horror is fascinating to me. The the act of physical transformation, of inhabiting a new body, of learning how to, to operate in a new body that isn't your own is something that I've always been fascinated in. And apparently that was kind of his stock and trade, especially in the uh, Well World series. So I'll probably definitely be looking into more of his stuff. It's just very of its time. You kind of have to keep that in mind. I mean, he was writing in the 70s and 80s and 90s, mostly 70s and 80s. Um, so you really do just kind of have to keep that in mind. But it was just, there was just something so strange and compelling about these. And I never hear, I was looking it up and I don't hear a lot of people talking about these online. Um, like people, people mention Chalker on like Reddit and things. And they mentioned that he was, you know, he had a little bit, you know, some pervy tendencies, but nobody really seemed to delve into a lot of these themes in a, in a way that I, in, in the way that I was thinking about them. So I just thought I would make this little ramble video and just kind of talk about Chalker and about my experience with this series and, and all of the things that sort of intrigued me about it. So if that sounds intriguing to you, I would I would give it a look. They're short books. They're all about 300 pages long. Incredibly quick, fast reads. Not taxing at all. Chalker's style is very simple, um, but very, uh, very direct, but, but, you know, but occasionally funny and clever. He just seemed like a really interesting person, and, and I, I'm sad that we lost him so soon because it would have been really interesting to see if he would have engaged with these themes a little bit more directly or to sort of, uh, to sort of talk with him more directly about these themes. I don't know. It was just... Yeah, it just left me with a lot to think about, so, yeah. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. I'm going to start working on this big project that I've been talking about in earnest. Um, I'm still in the middle of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, but since that's only one book out of, like, you know, these three that I was in the middle of reading, I, I'll, it'll be easier for me to focus on the big project. So hopefully you'll be hearing more about that soon. I will let you guys know if I can. Um, but, yeah, uh, until then, I hope you guys enjoyed, and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.